Welcome everyone to our SNAC seminar uh, for this week. Um, it's, it's our pleasure to, to invite Professor Kenji Doya, uh, who uh, I've admired uh, Kenji's work for, for such a long time. And it, it's really a, a pleasure to be able to, to meet face to face, unfortunately not in person. Um, but so Kenji's work really stood out to me uh, when I was learning about the neuromodulatory system and its impact on the rest of the brain, because Kenji is, is one of the few scholars uh, to my mind that has really tried to tackle the idea of what different neuromodulators uh, do on, in the brain, and rather than just focusing on one particular neuromodulator like dopamine or serotonin, Kenji's really thought deeply about the impact that each of those different subsystems of the arousal system can have and also how they might work in concert. And so I'm, I'm really excited today to hear uh, what you've been working on. Um, in particular, I've been working a little bit recently on, on some ideas around serotonin. So I'm really eager to hear your thoughts on, on how it impacts the rest of the brain. And maybe we can have some interesting discussions at the end about that. So thank you very much. Yeah, Mark, thank you very much uh, for a uh, uh, nice uh, introduction. Yeah. Right, so uh, uh, let me then uh, share the screen and uh, start uh, my talk. So do you see my uh, slide? Yep, that's great. Yeah. Okay, All right. So uh, uh, I set my title today as a uh, neuromodulation of inference control uh, in the cortical circuits, but uh, probably uh, it was uh, a bit uh, too much. I cannot uh, talk everything about the cortical control, but uh, anyway, so I would uh, uh, present uh, our works regarding uh, neuromodulation and then uh, reinforcement learning and uh, also uh, the topic which we are uh, more recently addressing like a mental simulation. Okay, so first, uh, uh, our self-introduction. So uh, we are uh, on the other side uh, of the Pacific, and uh, Okinawa is here uh, in the middle of the ocean. And then uh, it takes a two and a half hour flight from uh, Tokyo, uh, but uh, there are uh, even closer uh, flights from other uh, major cities uh, uh, in East Asia. Although unfortunately they are currently suspended for the COVID. Uh, but uh, we would like to uh, invite people, not only tourists, uh, but also uh, students and researchers to this uh, beautiful island to uh, start uh, uh, exciting uh, science. And then we are still, uh, our university opened in the 2011, uh, almost 10 years ago. So we are still a, a young graduate university of, of about eight faculty members. So, but with the small uh, head count, if you divide by the number, sometimes the number becomes uh, uh, very large. So for example, in the previous uh, uh, nature index, uh, they uh, ranked as, 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 as a number nine, slightly above St Stanford and Massachusetts. And then uh, we hope to keep this uh, uh, trend in the future as well. Right. Okay, and then uh, uh, my uh, unit uh, is called uh, a neural computation unit. So uh, uh, including uh, people working on robotics and then uh, modeling uh, and also the neural modeling experiments. Those are written uh, in uh, red uh, students. So uh, our lab happened to be quite uh, a popular uh, lab uh, for our students uh, that comes from uh, all around the world. And then the, uh, the aim uh, of our unit uh, is uh, first is to create uh, flexible uh, learning systems uh, and also uh, analyze and uh, review the brain's uh, learning mechanisms. So uh, we, on one side, we do machine learning and robotics uh, experiments, and also we perform uh, neurobiology experiments uh, using uh, rats and mice. And the, but the, common uh, framework uh, is uh, reinforcement learning. So as uh, many of you know, so this is a framework uh, for uh, an agent to monitor the state of the environment and perform action and get the reward, and then try to find the uh, action policy which maximize the forthcoming reward, right? And 
coming up with a good algorithm for efficient reinforcement learning is a very important topic for uh, engineering. Uh, and we are also very much interested in the circuit and the molecular mechanism for reinforced learning in the brain. And if you have uh, some uh, uh, progress in one uh, side, maybe that will give a good uh, uh, inspiration for the other. So that's why we try to uh, 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 approach uh, two directions uh, simultaneously. Yeah. So uh, we have been applying uh, this uh, uh, reinforced learning framework, uh, many topics. So this is rather old work, uh, but uh, learning uh, to stand up. Uh, so this uh, robot is about 70 centimeter high, and then uh, we didn't tell how to move, but uh, after uh, exploration, the robots figure out what is the uh, good uh, posture and what is the good uh, action to take in a uh, given uh, posture, right? And then here we gave a reward as a, a function of the height from the uh, floor. And also when it held down, we get, uh, gave a negative reward uh, as a punishment. Right? And uh, after hundreds of uh, bumps and falls, uh, this robot could finally find, uh, learn this kind of nice uh, standing up behavior. So, uh, and then by doing this kind of uh, physical experiments, uh, uh, we learned uh, a lot of things. So. Uh, uh, one uh, is the uh, problem of uh, how to design the uh, reward function. Right? So this height of the head is positive reward and the bumping, uh, falling is a negative reward, but uh, it, their balance is uh, quite important. Uh, for example, if you uh, make a too big punishment for the falling down, the, some robot may end up uh, deciding just to keep uh, lying down to avoid any harm. That is obviously not a very uh, good the solution for this problem, right? And also the how to set the uh, uh, positive reward as a function of the height, either linear or Gaussian, that can also uh, ha have an effect. And another thing uh, is the, like uh, some parameters uh, for reinforcement uh, uh, lighting. So, uh, in this uh, motion, uh, you can see that initially the robot keeps uh, its head uh, on the floor where the reward is still zero. But by pushing up its uh, center of mass uh, above the foot, it can uh, stand up subsequently. So this is a example of a delayed reward uh, task. Right? So uh, even though the immediate reward is zero, you have to aim and perform an action to uh, improve the later uh, reward, right? So, uh, and in the reinforcement learning, there's a parameter to control such a, a delayed reward. And uh, if the setting is not very good, uh, for example, uh, we may find a simple solution, like just a sitting up and then uh, get uh, some uh, intermediate level of reward quickly. So, uh, and then uh, by working with these robots, uh, we found uh, uh, problems of uh, how to define the reward function and how to set up uh, the parameters for uh, reinforcement learning. And then, so uh, in the usual reinforcement learning, reward and the uh, like parameters like temporal discounting is a part of a problem setup. So uh, uh, optimizing reward or temporal discounting parameter does not make sense in a regular reinforcement learning framework. So that's why we ended up uh, building uh, uh, this kind of uh, robots. So uh, uh, we should think of some higher level goal. Uh, in the biological system, the, our reward is uh, linked with uh, survival uh, and uh, reproduction. So this robot uh, catches a battery pack uh, to uh, uh, survive. Uh, and then uh, after sufficient uh, uh, charging, they look for a kind of a mating partner. And then it has a camera and also an infrared communication port so that the, now they are uh, exchanging uh, their genes or parameters uh, for the reinforcement learning. And then by introducing the uh, random mutation and the selection by the goodness uh, of the uh, charging level. So we could implement a distributed evolution in which the revolution could be evolved. So uh, that's the kind of uh, engineering uh, uh, or machine learning approaches uh, we have been uh, doing, right? Okay, so, uh, and the, uh, 
reinforcement learning has uh, several uh, basic uh, computations. One uh, is the prediction of the future reward starting from a certain state or performing certain action at, uh, at a certain state. Uh, they are called a state value function uh, or action value function. The evaluation is given by the cumulative future reward with a temporal discounting by gamma. So this E is an expression over the stochasticity of the environment and the policy. Right? And if uh, gamma is zero, you just focus on the immediate outcome. And uh, as gamma goes close to one, you take into account longer delayed outcome. And uh, such a uh, prediction reward is helpful for guiding uh, your action. For example, the action value function uh, can be used for action selection. Uh, for a given state, you look for the action which maximizes the uh, predictive future reward. That is called a, a greedy uh, action selection. But in the early uh, learning, so this action value function uh, you have learned is not uh, uh, accurate. So you want to do uh, stochastic search. And the popular way is so-called the Boltzmann action selection, uh, in which the action value is taken as a kind of negative energy. Uh, so the uh, action with a higher action value is uh, selected with a higher uh, probability. And here, beta uh, is the inverse temperature parameter. So if a beta is zero, you take all the actions with Z. And as the beta goes larger, any small difference in the action values are, are expanded. So the uh, action choice becomes uh, more greedy. And then uh, after you took an action, you learn from the uh, actual result. And uh, the main criterion for uh, such a learning uh, is so-called temporal difference error, which is a, a difference between the reward uh, you predicted versus the reward that you actually got and your reward you still predict from the new state discounted by gamma. So, uh, and then if uh, this uh, uh, temporal difference uh, signal is uh, positive or negative, maybe uh, you can uh, uh, update your previous estimate of the uh, cumulative reward uh, in proportion to such an you know, error. So you can, uh, this is the TD error for the state value function, and you can derive a similar thing for the action value function and update the action value, uh, state value for the previous state or state, uh, What? Were there any problem with the uh, video? Yeah. Uh, we, we can hear you. I think your video just froze for a little while, but it's fine. We can hear you and see your cursor, so it should be fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. And then uh, also we can update the uh, action value function in proportion to uh, this uh, temporal difference error. So here the alpha is a learning rate of how quickly uh, you uh, update your memory uh, for a single uh, trial, a single action. And then uh, important uh, issue uh, is uh, how to implement uh, uh, these steps of uh, prediction and the uh, selection and uh, learning. Uh, and for example, the recent breakthrough uh, in uh, uh, reinforced learning uh, was a successful uh, use of uh, deep uh, learning for the approximation of the state value function or action value function. And another important uh, issue is how to set up uh, these parameters. As I just told, uh, the importance of setting the right uh, temporal discounting, and also how to control the uh, uh, exploration versus exploitation uh, is an uh, uh, important topic for the uh, setting. And also the uh, avoiding like uh, uh, catastrophic forgetting. So uh, uh, as you learn something new, you wouldn't uh, want to forget what you have learned. So this uh, uh, learning rate has to be also controlled appropriately. So, uh, and then uh, such uh, tuning of uh, the hyperparameters uh, is uh, uh, called uh, uh, a kind of a meta-learning. So these are very important uh, issues in the practical implementation of our reinforcement learning. Uh, but uh, we thought that maybe these are important problems, not only for uh, engineering application, uh, but also for our brain uh, as well. Right? 
So our brain may not be using the same equation as this, but the uh, brain would be performing something like a, a reward prediction or action choice or learning for the actual outcome. And how such a computation are implemented in the circuit in the brain. And how are these parameters uh, regulated in the brain? Uh, for example, uh, in some kind of a, a molecular mechanism. So these are very interesting problems. So that's uh, how the, they, they are the major topic uh, of our neuroscience research. Okay. So, uh, and then the, uh, regarding the uh, brain's implementation uh, of uh, reinforcement learning, so uh, uh, we think uh, uh, like uh, many other people uh, that uh, basal ganglia uh, would uh, play a very important role. Uh, as many of you know, the basal ganglia has a, a kind of a loop circuit starting with a cortex through the uh, striatum and the pilum, and then the thalamus back to the cortex. And the important feature of the basal ganglia is that the input site striatum receives a stronger dopaminergic input from the substantia nigra. So this is a more like an engineering type of view. Uh, and then the, uh, some of the uh, striatal neurons are project uh, uh, to the pilum, and the, some others project to the dopamine neurons uh, in the substantia nigra. So uh, uh, our specific uh, uh, hypothesis uh, was that the, some of the neurons uh, in the uh, stratum uh, learn like a uh, state value function, uh, others learn the action value function, uh, utilizing the, uh, the TD error like uh, responses uh, of the dopamine neurons. So indeed, uh, the Wolfram Schutz uh, and the, his group uh, show that the dopamine neurons show uh, reward production error like behavior. Uh, and also my colleague uh, in uh, OIST, Jeff Wickens, showed that the synapse uh, connecting from the cortex to the striatum has a specific form of plasticity, which depends on dopamine. Right? So uh, that uh, is our uh, like a hypothesis. And then we have done uh, several type of uh, experiments, uh, for example, electro, electro recording of the striatal neurons, and uh, most recently, we used the uh, uh, calcium imaging of the striatal neurons uh, to allow the serotype specific recording. So these are the uh, neurons uh, in the uh, striosome, which is known to project to the uh, midbrain dopamine neurons. Right? So with the selective uh, uh, marker, we succeeded uh, uh, recording the uh, activity of those neurons uh, uh, using uh, uh, this uh, uh, endoscopic uh, imaging system. And then uh, as the uh, mice learned uh, uh, classical conditioning task, associating order Q uh, with the uh, forthcoming reward, we could show that uh, uh, these uh, neurons acquire reward predictive uh, uh, responses, which is consistent with the hypothesis that the neurons uh, in the striosome connecting to the dopamine neurons with the uh, uh, learn the state value function. Right. Okay. So, uh, uh, but uh, this framework, a uh, very simple framework of reinforcement learning is so-called model-free uh, reinforcement learning. So in this case, the, uh, we assume no knowledge uh, by the uh, agent about the world. Uh, and then the uh, agent learn the state value or action value uh, from a, a sequence of experience of a state action reward and space action reward. So the uh, algorithm is very simple. Uh, uh, animals, uh, agent would make almost a reactive action for a given state. So uh, it is very simple, but tend to need uh, a lot of uh, uh, experience. For example, when the goal of behavior changed. Uh, in the model-based uh, strategy, so agents uh, learn the prediction model of uh, action-dependent state of transition. So then uh, you can use such a uh, model uh, for internal simulation to estimate the current state from the previous actions, 
or plan ahead for the uh, future action to reach to the desired state. Right? So especially, uh, yeah, so when the uh, state of transition uh, stays the same and the goal of the behavior changed, that will uh, allow uh, flexible uh, adaptation. But internal computation uh, can be uh, more complicated. So uh, then how to select between simple uh, model-free reinforcement learning or more uh, adaptive, uh, flexible, but heavy model-based strategy? That is a very interesting uh, uh, topic. So uh, this is uh, uh, the example uh, by my former PhD student, uh, Pablo Parmas. Uh, of uh, uh, controlling this uh, smartphone-based robot uh, to bounce up and then uh, keep balancing. Of course, initially, this robot makes uh, this kind of uh, almost random movement. But by doing this, uh, uh, this robot makes an internal model of how the body responds to the wheel movement. And then the using uh, internal uh, simulation, so uh, it can find out a uh, uh, good uh, po feedback policy. So then uh, within uh, less than 10 uh, trials, the robot could learn this kind of a bouncing and the balance uh, behavior. So this is one example of uh, the data efficiency of a uh, uh, model-based uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, so uh, we can define uh, the, uh, this uh, model-based uh, approach uh, in the brain uh, as a kind of mental uh, simulation. So yeah, there's occasional uh, <laughs> latency problem, uh, but uh, uh, the, we can define the mental simulation as a brain process using uh, action dependent state transition model. So uh, S prime uh, equal FSA, this is a, a deterministic case. And this uh, S prime given S and A is uh, like a stochastic case. <laughs> So if you have such an action-dependent state of transition model, uh, you can uh, use that for estimating the present uh, state, uh, even if that is occluded or noisy, uh, based on the uh, previous state and action. And you can use that for planning of the uh, good action or action sequence to uh, reach to a desired state. Or you can apply such a model to an arbitrary state uh, for a kind of imagination or a thought experiment. So uh, such a mechanism would be very important. For example, when we imagine a situation based on some kind of text, or uh, when we uh, develop a uh, uh, theory of science by thought experiments. Right? So uh, this uh, uh, mental simulation is a very important uh, uh, brain function, starting from a sensory motor control to a higher cognitive function. But the, how such a uh, uh, state of transition models are learned in the brain and how they are utilized for estimation or planning. Uh, that is a, a fascinating uh, topic uh, in the neuroscience, I think. So uh, uh, we set out to address uh, such uh, problem. Uh, for example, using uh, functional MRI, we did a kind of a computer game uh, of uh, moving uh, uh, this uh, marker uh, from the starting point to the goal state. And to make uh, this game interesting, uh, we limited the uh, motion of a direction uh, movement of the cursor to only three out of eight neighbors by the pressing of the three different buttons. Right? So uh, uh, for certain direction, there's no straight away. So you have to find some kind of a zigzag path. So uh, which uh, is uh, why we call it the uh, uh, grid sailing task rather than the, like a grid, a simple grid the world task. Right? And then the finding this kind of pass just by uh, random uh, trial and error is uh, quite uh, difficult. But once you have uh, uh, this kind of action dependent state transition model, uh, you can efficiently uh, explore and find this kind of path. Right? And then uh, we first presented the, to the subject the goal position. 
uh, after the subject had learned this uh, uh, key map or action dependent state transition model and gave them some time to plan ahead uh, for the right path. And then uh, we can verify from their behavior that they are indeed benefiting this uh, pre-start uh, delay time by mental simulation. And then the file subjects are engaging in the mental simulation, we uh, address the uh, increase in the brain activity and found the areas like a prior, a prior, parietal cortex, premotor cortex, or those lateral prefrontal cortex uh, for mental simulation. But in addition, so uh, different parts of the cerebellum uh, or the uh, basal ganglia, which are known to be connected with these uh, areas, are also activated. So uh, this uh, uh, result suggests that there's a, a kind of a global uh, network linking the cortex, cerebellum, and basal ganglia utilized for uh, uh, mental simulation. So uh, our uh, interpretation of uh, this uh, uh, result uh, is uh, like this. So uh, and the, the, there has been uh, computational models uh, regarding the function of the cerebellum, basal ganglia, and the cerebral cortex. So cerebellum uh, is uh, uh, like a specialized for the supervised learning based on the climbing fiber input from the inferior olive, which will be very useful for uh, supervised learning. So for example, supervised learning will be helpful for acquisition of action dependent state of transition model, especially for uh, like a deterministic uh, transitions like uh, in the previous uh, game. And then uh, as I also uh, presented, the basal ganglia is uh, uh, supposed to play an important role uh, in uh, reinforcement learning based on the reward or reward prediction error signal from the substantial nigra. And then the cerebral cortex uh, uh, may not have a specific uh, uh, teaching signal, but it is shown to have an uh, unsupervised learning capability to come up with a different representation about the, uh, the state uh, and the action. Uh, and also uh, uh, cortical areas have the mechanism for uh, holding a working memory. So uh, uh, our uh, hypothesis, uh, interpretation of our result uh, that uh, for a given uh, state representation, so uh, somewhere uh, in the brain, the, there's a kind of a, a candidate of action uh, generated, and uh, this uh, forward model in the cerebrum would uh, predict the resulting state, and then the basal ganglia would evaluate the goodness of such a predicted state, and if it's that good enough, uh, you uh, uh, bring that for execution. So uh, that is a, a kind of a, a, a picture we are uh, envisioning, but maybe we should do some uh, more study, like for example, uh, decoding uh, from uh, this area to actually uh, demonstrate that. Okay. And then we are also interested in the, what uh, uh, happening uh, in the cortical areas, right? uh, in the neuron level. And uh, to address uh, uh, that uh, uh, problem, so uh, fortunately, uh, I have a, a collaborator on the same floor, uh, Professor Bernd Kuhn, who is an expert in the two-photon uh, calcium imaging. So uh, my former postdoc, Aki Funamizu, developed a kind of auditory virtual environment. The mouse uh, walks on this air-floated wall uh, with the head the hip fixed under the two-photon microscope. Uh, uh, and then the, based on the, uh, the mouse's step, the sound feedback uh, is uh, uh, updated. And then the, uh, uh, as the, uh, when, when the uh, mouse uh, reached to the, the sound source uh, in this virtual environment, the uh, sugar water reward is presented. And uh, why the animal is performing uh, this behavior, uh, we could uh, monitor like uh, a few hundreds uh, of uh, neurons uh, uh, in the uh, posterior parietal cortex of the mouse. Right? So, uh, and then uh, we uh, also performed uh, the uh, like a decoding uh, experiment. So, uh, first uh, we uh, 
record uh, the uh, distance tuning of uh, these neurons uh, in the parietal cortex. And then from uh, instantaneous uh, activity level, uh, we can uh, perform a Bayesian decoding uh, of the uh, distance represented by the population activity. And this is a kind of a posterior uh, probability distribution. And then the, as the uh, mouse walks toward the goal, we observe that this uh, posterior distribution also uh, follows the uh, real uh, distance. And then in this experiment, we sometimes omitted the sound feedback. Here, the uh, red uh, segment, we give a sound feedback, and then white segment, we, there's no sound feedback. But still, this uh, neural representation followed the tracked the real uh, distance. And when the sound feedback is turned on, the uncertainty was uh, removed. So uh, this is uh, something uh, similar to uh, what we expect uh, for uh, like a dynamic Bayesian filter or uh, like a Kalman filter. So uh, uh, when the uh, sensory uh, input uh, is not uh, uh, sufficient, you use an internal model to predict the current state. And then when the sensory feedback is available, you uh, uh, like refine your uh, prediction. So uh, the results suggest that there's something like a, such a Bayesian, uh, dynamic Bayesian inference uh, uh, going on uh, in the parietal cortical circuit. So, uh, and then uh, we are very much interested in uh, understanding the, the, the uh, mechanism of a sensory in inference and uh, motor uh, control uh, in, in the brain. So uh, uh, it has been well known that uh, uh, control and the inference has a very uh, interesting relationship. So it was uh, uh, already in the uh, 1960s that Kalman showed that the uh, circuit used for uh, optimal filtering uh, is very similar to the circuit used for optimal control. So uh, uh, this was uh, known as a kind of beauty uh, of a uh, duality of a uh, control and uh, uh, inference uh, in the control theory. But uh, more recently, uh, machine learning people uh, paid attention to this relationship. For example, the, the Daniel Levine uh, made a good uh, tutorial uh, about uh, uh, this relationship between the inference and the uh, control. Right? So uh, uh, his uh, specific proposal is that by assuming uh, like a variable called optimality variable, and then by defining the uh, reward function uh, as uh, like a log of the optimality, so uh, then you can apply uh, the uh, Bayesian inference framework for the problem of uh, reinforcement learning. So uh, assuming that uh, your behavior was optimal, what could have been the action you uh, uh, performed and then the corresponding uh, state sequence? So uh, uh, this way uh, you can uh, apply the uh, algorithms developed for Bayesian inference for reinforcement learning or reinforcement learning for Bayesian inference. So that kind of a, uh, correspondence was uh, well documented. And then uh, a specific uh, uh, algorithm he uh, came up with uh, using a, uh, like a message uh, passing uh, framework, which is commonly used in Bayesian inference for computation of uh, something uh, similar to the state value function uh, and the action value function. So uh, these are uh, uh, very uh, interesting uh, uh, computational uh, insight. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that is very uh, interesting in terms of uh, the understanding the, the cortical arch architecture. So as you know, the uh, posterior half of the cortex uh, is mainly involved in the sensory inference. 
And the frontal half of the cortex is mainly interested in the uh, involved in uh, control or planning. So, but still, the similar kind of a six layer structure is uh, uh, preserved for the entire cortex, although the thickness uh, and the cell types of uh, different, different layers are somewhat different. For example, uh, layer four is uh, thicker in the sensory cortex and uh, almost uh, uh, non existent in the motor cortex. Uh, but uh, uh, this uh, uh, duality or relationship between the inference and the control may give us a clue as to uh, understanding the uh, function of the canonical uh, circuit uh, of the cortex, uh, both the sensory side and the motor side. So for the, the sensory side, there has been already uh, a lot of proposals uh, of uh, how uh, different uh, uh, neurons in different layers uh, perform uh, computations uh, uh, like uh, representing a, a top-down flyer or bottom-up signal or uh, integrating them uh, through the uh, circuit uh, across the uh, layers. Then the, uh, based on the uh, correspondence uh, between the inference and control, we should be able to uh, come up with the fu functions of uh, different uh, neurons in the uh, motor cortex. So uh, this is a, a one possible uh, uh, proposal, uh, like uh, deeper uh, uh, layer neurons uh, represent the state value function, and then uh, superficial layer represent the action value function. So we have to test and see, uh, but uh, at least uh, this uh, theory gives us uh, some kind of a hypothesis uh, worthy of uh, testing. So, uh, and then addressing this uh, using uh, uh, either uh, multi neuron recording or uh, cross layer uh, calcium imaging uh, to test is uh, something we are uh, aiming to do uh, in, in the near future. Right. Okay, so uh, that. Uh, uh, is uh, about the uh, implementation of the uh, reinforcement learning and then the inference uh, in the basal ganglia and the cortex. So is there any question uh, up to this point or should we have a discussion later, uh, questions uh, later? Yeah. If you have uh, any quick question, I can uh, take at this point. Yeah, if anyone has a question and wants to unmute or, or raise, a, raise a hand. I have a quick one actually on, on this. I, I, um, I haven't come across this paper yet, but it looks fantastic. And I'm, I'm so happy to see uh, people kind of embracing the challenges of uh, making inferences from a lot of our research, which is done on the sensory cortex. Usually V1 is kind of what everyone typically thinks the, the whole cortex looks like. Trying to extend that out to think about the, the spectrum of cortical inputs. I guess my question for you is how, how precise do you think we're going to need to be in terms of knowing exactly which connect, uh, cell population connects to which or which interneuron population matters here or there to get the kind of uh, a match to computation? Or do you think that they'll, do you think we could have a very low dimensional representation mm -hmm. of the cortex where it's just a little bit of input and output? Or do you think that we really will need the sort of really precise connections between oh, okay. layers to, to really understand it? Yeah, so I was first uh, focused on like a pyramidal neurons, which sends uh, output to the uh, uh, like a feed forward direction or feedback direction. So uh, which may represent uh, uh, very uh, important uh, information. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, uh, the local inhibitor neurons are uh, shaping uh, such a uh, representation of function. So uh, uh, after figuring out the representation uh, by the pyramid neurons, uh, then uh, include uh, inferior neurons to uh, ask how such representation is uh, realized. Uh, that would also be a very important uh, next step. But currently, so we are aiming to do like imaging of the pyramid neurons in the superficial layers and also deep layers, hopefully simultaneously, yeah. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, okay, do we have any, any questions or should uh, Professor Doya just continue on? All right, why, why don't you keep forging ahead and if anyone has a question, they can raise their hand and we'll, we'll pause. Yeah. 
Okay, so then the uh, let me go to the uh, second part. So uh, uh, I already told that the tuning these parameters uh, like uh, temporal discounting or inverse temperature or running rate they are very important for uh, successful learning. So this is a uh, one example uh, of a robot. Uh, finding a battery pack and then uh, uh, approaching to it. So as uh, it makes an experience, so uh, it can go straight ahead to the target. And uh, this robot was initially doing uh, like a, a random exploration, but somehow learned to sit still, even though it can uh, see the uh, battery pack. And unless it, uh, it is uh, shown really close, if it is further than certain distance, he's not any not interested. So we wonder why this robot is so uh, depressed. So, uh, okay, right. And this is uh, what was happening. So for the robot on the right-hand side, uh, the setting of this parameter gamma was uh, fairly small. So if the gamma is uh, large enough, but even you have to spend certain energy, if you can charge back, the uh, entire evaluation uh, is positive. But if uh, uh, gamma is small, the gamma square, gamma cube, and on, so on, becomes uh, uh, quickly converged to zero. So there's no, almost no wait for the future uh, reward. So the entire evaluation can be ne negative. So that makes uh, the uh, better stay idle. So that's why this kind of a depressed uh, like behavior is seen. And, uh, but uh, that small setting gamma does not always uh, make an agent quiescent. In the situation, like uh, it is uh, uh, linked with uh, uh, immediate uh, reward, but uh, later big punishment. So uh, this uh, steep discounting, uh, makes uh, the agent blind to this uh, future punishment. So uh, it can end up uh, in uh, impulsive uh, behavior. Right? So uh, uh, we knew from our uh, reinforced learning experiments that uh, this uh, temporal discounting parameter is a very interesting parameter that affects the character of uh, reinforcement learning uh, agents. So then the question is how to set up uh, this uh, gamma uh, in the uh, right uh, level. So from this picture, you may think that the gamma is larger, the better. But if you set up gamma very large, you have to predict the long, 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 long future. So that makes your prediction more difficult. So this uh, gamma has to be large enough, but it shouldn't be too large. So that's why engineers uh, end up tuning this gamma to 0.9 or 0.99 and so on. Right? But the probably uh, this uh, setting of the right uh, time frame would be uh, important for humans and uh, animals uh, in their reinforcement learning. Right? So then uh, what could be the mechanism for such a regulation of uh, temporal discounting or prediction time frame? So, uh, and then the hypothesis we came up uh, is uh, the serotonergic system. So uh, because the, the most of the uh, drugs used for depression uh, has the uh, function of uh, uh, enhancing the serotonergic transmission, maybe that will bring uh, this kind of state back to this state. Right? And also there are some uh, prior work suggesting that uh, uh, damage to the serotonergic system make uh, uh, animal uh, more impulsive. So uh, that is a kind of a, uh, our starting point of our interest in neuromodulation. So uh, as uh, many of you know, neuromodulators uh, have a uh, origin uh, in the brainstem and then project widely uh, in the cortex and the uh, cerebellum and vessel ganglia. And then, so uh, rather than like a point-to-point -point communication uh, by the glutamate uh, or GABA, so uh, they appear to send some kind of a broadcast uh, signal. And then uh, we already knew uh, that the dopamine plays a very important uh, role uh, in the reinforced learning by providing this global learning signal, temporal difference error. So uh, we started to think that maybe other major neuromodulators 
like acetylcholine, noradrenaline, and serotonin may play a role in uh, uh, regulating uh, the global parameters uh, of our reinforcement learning. So uh, the, uh, our candidate uh, uh, functions were the acetylcholine for the controlling of uh, learning rate and the noradrenaline for the control uh, of the uh, exploration and the serotonin for the control of uh, tem temporal discounting. How far into the future you should uh, uh, take into account? So uh, uh, then the, uh, in Okinawa, so we started the lab uh, focusing uh, on uh, serotonin uh, function. We did the uh, record, electoral recording uh, and also microdialysis experiments, uh, but uh, most recently uh, we are uh, using uh, optogenetic uh, approach. So fortunately, uh, we had a collaborator who developed a uh, transgenic uh, mouse line, which uh, pro uh, express uh, serotonin se uh, channel robots, rhodopsin selectively in uh, serotonin neurons. So uh, in this uh, uh, mouse, the uh, blue light opens the channel and yellow light uh, the closes the channel. So this is a control stimulation by yellow light. So here the uh, mouse is waiting for a food pellet to come out. And he abandoned and reset the trial uh, and then uh, start again. In this case, uh, with the blue light, uh, we are stimulating uh, the serotonin neurons. And compared to the uh, uh, control case, the mouse uh, in this uh, trial waited for the food, one food pellet for uh, about 20 seconds. So we changed the waiting time between three, six, and nine, and the infinity, meaning reward omission. So for a long waiting, like a nine second, the animal often makes an, a, a waiting error or abandoning, but that is a reduced with the blue eye stimulation. For the omission trial, I mean, usually abandon after 10 to 12 seconds, but with a certain situation, they could wait much longer, like 16, 18 seconds. So uh, this uh, suggests, uh, shows uh, that uh, activation of certain neurons uh, will, will make animal more patient for the, the delayed reward. Right? So that uh, was an important observation, but uh, uh, Katsuhiko and Kayoko who did this experiments further study the features of uh, this serotonin stimulation. So, and then uh, what they found was interesting. So, uh, uh, when the reward omission uh, is uh, only uh, once in uh, four trial, this uh, certain inspiration had a significant effect. But uh, in the opposite case, uh, reward priority is a 25%. Uh, reward simulation, uh, certain simulation did not take effect for expen uh, extending the weighting. And then even when we increase the amount of reward to equate the uh, expected reward, it didn't take effect either. So the uh, certainty of a reward delivery seems to be important for serotonin simulation to be effective. And uh, we also found that when we uh, gave, gave the uh, food plate uh, always the same timing, the effect was uh, quite uh, small. But as we made the timing more variable, the effect of serotonin simulation uh, was more pronounced. And even when we make the largest weighting uh, to the same, so the effect was a small, right? So uh, uh, the, this uh, serotonin st stimulation uh, is effective. The uh, delivery of reward is certain, but the timing of delivery, delivery is uncertain. So it is a quite uh, uh, intriguing uh, feature. So, uh, and uh, this is hard to explain uh, based on uh, a simple uh, uh, temporal discounting in the model-free reinforcement learning paradigm. So uh, that's why uh, we moved on uh, to uh, like a, a kind of model-based decision uh, paradigm. So assuming that the mice have an internal model of, uh, of when the reward uh, is presented. Right? And then the, uh, for example, this is the uh, uh, probability distribution of the when the reward is presented. And as the, the mouse waits for the food pellet and the, the food pellet doesn't come off, so the likelihood for the trial to be rewarded 
uh, comes down. And then the, uh, in the Bayesian framework, this uh, likelihood is combined with the prior expectation of the reward to uh, uh, compute the posterior probability. So uh, uh, for the same uh, likelihood, drop of likelihood, uh, with the different uh, prior level, uh, this uh, tail can be uh, longer. So, uh, and then uh, uh, we could show that if you assume that the serotonin simulation uh, kind of enhances the like a prior uh, reward up probability assumption, so then we can reproduce the uh, longer waiting uh, for the uh, delayed reward. And also, uh, uh, this uh, uh, likelihood function has a longer tail uh, when the reward timing is uncertainty. The effect is more pronounced when the timing of the reward delivery is uh, uncertain. So, uh, and we could uh, uh, approximate such uh, uh, experimental uh, observation using a uh, uh, simulation of uh, a Bayesian uh, inference model. And then uh, uh, Katsuhiko and Kayoko went on to study uh, where in the brain this uh, serotonin simulation uh, is taking effect. So they performed a uh, terminal stimulation experiment uh, at the orbitofrontal cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens. So all those areas receive a serotonergic projection from the dorsal raphe, where we stimulated in the previous uh, experiments. So, uh, and uh, uh, what we found uh, is that uh, uh, nucleus accumbens stimulation in this uh, paradigm doesn't have a significant effect uh, compared to the good effect by the do uh, dorsal raphe uh, stimulation. And then orbital frontal uh, stimulation has the uh, effect uh, almost similar to the dorsal raphe stimulation. And then interesting medial frontal cortex simulation had the effect only when the reward timing was uncertain. So uh, uh, from this uh, uh, model, we extended uh, our uh, model to uh, have a, a multiple model of uh, reward uh, precision timing and uh, we could somehow uh, reproduce uh, the, uh, our experimental uh, findings. Okay. Professor Doya, we, we have a yeah. question from somebody. Uh, it says, I don't know who it is. It says Zoom user. Do you want to uh, yeah, unmute it and ask your question? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, this is Jack Canwell from uh, Georgetown. Um, I was uh, curious, uh, I don't know if it applies to this case, but if the animal, if the reward timing is uncertain, then does the animal also work harder to get the reward? Uh, so work harder means uh, like active uh, behavior. Uh, yes. Mm. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's a good question. So uh, uh, here we uh, took uh, like a like a stationary uh, waiting, uh, but uh, one of uh, our graduate student uh, Masakazu performed uh, like a similar task. Uh, with a uh, uh, lever pressing. Right? So uh, like a lever press uh, eight times or 16 times or 32 times to uh, get the reward. And then very intriguingly, so the uh, serotonin stimulation did not uh, uh, have a, a strong effect like in a, a waiting case. So uh, we still don't uh, understand why that is the case, uh, but uh, uh, what we found is that uh, for quiescent waiting and then uh, uh, active uh, uh, lever pressing, uh, effect of uh, uh, serotonin stimulation uh, is uh, different. So uh, uh, maybe by uh, performing uh, the similar uh, kind of a uh, uh, different uh, terminal uh, stimulation, we may be able to uh, understand the, what is the difference uh, for the uh, quiescence waiting and uh, active uh, 
motion. But yeah, that is a very uh, important point which we are currently analyzing. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, so then the, uh, for the uh, serotonin, uh, the for the, the simple uh, hypothesis like a serotonin controls a temper discounting. So uh, I often receive the uh, question like uh, there are so many uh, different uh, serotonin receptors and how can the serotonin have a single function? That's a very reasonable uh, question. Uh, but uh, one uh, thing uh, we should think about uh, is that uh, uh, for uh, same broadcast uh, message, the correct, res correct response may be different, uh, bit different for different uh, recipients. Right? Uh, for example, when the exchange rate is changed, uh, the action you should take would be different if you are in the import business or export business. So, uh, and that is uh, why I think the serotonin has uh, uh, both uh, excitatory or inferior type of receptors, and they are expressed in uh, different uh, neurons. And then, yeah. and also uh, uh, recently, uh, subdivision of the serotonergic system uh, is uh, well analyzed. So dorsal rafe is uh, one major uh, source of serotonin to the forebrain, but the median rafe uh, also project to the hippocampus and other areas, and they, they're also descending pathways as well. And even within dorsal rafe, uh, more recent fine anatomy reviewed uh, dorsal and ventral or medial lateral part projects to different places. So, uh, and then can they uh, really carry the similar message? Uh, so, and uh, probably the, even though the uh, initially uh, message was the same, uh, depending on the uh, specific function of the recipient, those uh, specific pathway may have a, uh, developed a customized message. So uh, there might be some, uh, indeed some difference. And then uh, using uh, uh, recent uh, uh, cell type specific imaging or imaging uh, of the, uh, axon terminals uh, in a different uh, position in the brain. So clarifying uh, such uh, differences is also a, a very Im important uh, topic. Right. So can I, can I ask a, a question there, Professor Doya? Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you or any of your team looked at the different neurons of the RAFE or um, different compartments with the calcium imaging you mentioned before? Because it could be very interesting if there's fairly low dimensional activity patterns, right? If one of them is uh, increasing calcium, all of them increase, or if they have a much more heterogeneous mm -hmm. complex pattern. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what uh, we are trying now. So using oh, cool. uh, like an endoscope uh, to uh, monitor the activities uh, of uh, uh, different serotonin neurons in the dorsal rafe. So uh, uh, it, it is, a. Uh, Technically, not very easy. So uh, uh, the Katsuhiko uh, has, has been working hard to make a good enough uh, expression and also uh, getting a clear image. So yeah, we recently uh, start to take a pretty good image. So hopefully we can uh, tell you about uh, those uh, heter possible heterogeneity in the within the dorsal rafe uh, in the near future. Yeah. That's that's fantastic. Um, I I eagerly await what you find. Um, one of the reasons I was really curious about that is I was reading a paper recently that suggested that the different RAFE nuclei are interconnected with one another. So the median RAFE will send projections to the dorsal RAFE and vice versa. But often the projections are thought to be GABAergic, as if they might inhibit one another. And that's a little different than some of the other projections between other hubs of the arousal system. For example, mm -hmm. the locus cerulea sends projections to the basal nucleus of Maynard and the PPN, but they often are excitatory, or well, at least they will modulate it in an excitatory fashion using, say, alpha-1 receptors. And so mm -hmm. if that really is a, something that we could find in the serotonergic system, that it, it has um, control over which aspect of the circuitry is being active at a particular point in time, you can imagine that might bias the system towards using the same si signal to bias mm -hmm. certain parts of the brain to be active more than another one. I, I think that's a really, really exciting idea. So I'm very, very curious to see if you find 
functional evidence for that kind of uh, organization or not. Right, yeah. So, yeah, so we haven't uh, done that yet, but uh, for example, uh, comparing the effect of a stimulation or suppression of dose RFA versus mesian RFA, or uh, if possible, uh, simultaneous uh, recording by electrode uh, in uh, dose RFA and mesian RFA uh, might be uh, very, very interesting. Yeah, right. yeah undoubtedly. All right, thanks. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, and then the, uh, we are starting to uh, like extend uh, our view uh, about uh, serotonin, not just the temporal discounting, uh, but the uh, uh, more general origin uh, of uh, uh, serotonergic uh, signaling. Right. So, uh, uh, as you know, the serotonin uh, is a uh, uh, produced uh, from an uh, uh, essential amino acid tryptophan, which is known to uh, be a uh, responsive uh, feature. So uh, for example, the, the tryptophan play a very important role in the chlorophyll uh, and also the robot rhodopsin. And then some of the uh, certain receptors has a, a kind of a similarity with the like rhodopsin. So, uh, and then the uh, serotonin may have something uh, to do uh, with uh, uh, light. And uh, uh, for example, uh, it has been sh shown that uh, uh, having uh, good sunlight or even outside light, light in a certain uh, part uh, is uh, used for uh, like a therapy of uh, the depression. Right? <clears throat> so that kind of a uh, notion uh, led us to uh, uh, speculate that the, uh, serotonin has to do with something to do with a uh, uh, daytime or how much time you still have uh, for today. So uh, uh, it is uh, well known that the serotonin has uh, like a daily uh, up and down cycle, and it becomes high in, in the morning and then gradually come down uh, toward the uh, evening. So uh, uh, the in uh, uh, adaptive agents, so how much time you still have uh, is a very important uh, uh, parameter to affect your decision and the strategy. So, uh, uh, for example, in the case of uh, reinforcement learning, uh, this uh, temporal discounting uh, is uh, slow uh, when you have a, a lot of time. But if your time is limited, it's, there's no use uh, uh, counting on a very delayed reward. Right? And also, the, uh, when the time is available, uh, you can uh, do wide exploration, and then uh, you can run gradually. And then the uh, in that also the in addition to the temporal discount, may expect that uh, uh, when the time is uh, enough, that you can use this eligibility trace to be longer. And the uh, yeah, so this different change in the temporal discounting with uh, make a, like a feature of a temporal discounting error for the immediate reward prediction to a long term reward prediction. And then the uh, model-based strategy uh, requires a longer time uh, for uh, computation. Maybe the, uh, uh, when you have more time, uh, you uh, have, have the leisure of taking a model-based uh, decision and also with the wider, uh, deeper search. And then the, in the sensory perception, uh, you uh, would uh, collect uh, more evidence uh, and then the, uh, this part is uh, uh, based on uh, our uh, excellent result. The, uh, uh, when the time is, uh, uh, you have sufficient time uh, or sufficient resource, uh, uh, you can expect the uh, perform uh, like optim uh, optimistically. So, but when the time is limited, the, you have to, uh, be more uh, like uh, realistic. Right? 
so uh, this availability of time and also some kind of uh, nutritious resources uh, may affect the agent uh, uh, learning and behavior strategy and even for the developmental uh, features. Right? So uh, and the serotonin is also involved in uh, development as well. So this is a kind of a, a, like a overall like a speculative hypothesis about uh, how the serotonin uh, came up uh, to uh, regulate the different aspects of development action and uh, learning. So basically, so uh, serotonin uh, signals uh, availability for more time or resources. So that is the kind of a speculation we are now uh, uh, proposed and then we have to uh, test them uh, in an experimental way. Okay, so uh, uh, that's uh, uh, what I prepared for today. And then I thank uh, for the, the collaborators uh, to make uh, this kind of uh, uh, research uh, possible. And finally, so uh, we are hosting uh, the Japanese uh, Neuroscience uh, Society meeting here in Okinawa uh, uh, from the end of uh, June to uh, uh, July. So hopefully the, by that time, the international travel uh, becomes uh, uh, more practical. Uh, and then we are going to uh, call for like a late breaking abstract submission in April. So I uh, hope uh, many of you uh, can uh, come visit Okinawa and then uh, join us uh, in this uh, uh, conference site uh, near the sea. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your attention.